So statement uh, two, yeah, this is a really important statement, that when do we receive the empowerment? We receive the empowerment when the meanings associated with empowerment arises in us. Right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So that means, you know, from another perspective, we can look at it as, you know, there is the uh, formal occasion of receiving empowerment and that formal occasion now has been uh, more or less you know mostly arranged into a ritual form and so there is a particular way of conferring the empowerment there's a particular way of receiving the empowerment the teacher has to prepare in this and this and this way the students should also prepare in this and this and that way so there's that and so here, remember in the notes offered by uh, Rinzhen Changchu, he says, this statement 2 of chapter 5 should be read uh, together uh, alongside uh, a statement in the auxiliary chapter. Uh, and that statement is statement 25 there. Even if one has realized, uh, so even if the meaning of this or that level of empowerment has arisen in us, one needs the rituals because the lineage is profound. Because in order to, to, to maintain the lineage so that, you know, it can further benefit more people. And also uh, the way these rituals, the ceremony have been arranged is not without meaning. So further refinement of our understanding. So realization, sometimes another big word, you know, we say realize, realization, realization, what does it mean? Understanding. Not superficial understanding, but deep understanding. So, so even when you have some understanding already about, say, the vase empowerment, it is still good to receive the vase empowerment properly. But uh, the main point still is, you know, why do we do that in order to further uh, induce uh, more detailed, more refined, more profound uh, understanding of the meaning that is being communicated, the meaning that is being pointed to by uh, this empowerment. So this empowerment, uh, maybe some of you might have read you know, Zen Buddhist material. In the Zen tradition, there is an emphasis on transmission. They, they, they talk about transmission. They say uh, it's a special transmission uh, independent of uh, the scriptures. In the Zen tradition, they say this is a special transmission uh, not reliant on scriptures, on texts. And they say, not dependent on words and phrases, directly pointing to the mind, so that when you see that nature, you can attain Buddhahood. These are very famous four lines of the Zen tradition. It's a verse with four lines. These are the four lines, actually. A special transmission independent of the scriptures, not reliant, not established, not not like uh, proved through words and phrases, directly, but instead directly pointing to the mind, directly pointing to the heart. That is the equivalent of what we call here empowerment, directly pointing to the heart. Then seeing that nature, to whatever degree we are able to see that nature when it's pointed out to us, seeing that nature, attaining Buddhahood, seeing that nature, a glimpse all the way to seeing that nature in a stable and unchanging way, Buddhahood. And so empowerment here, you know, carries that same meaning. So there is the more general sense of empowerment. And then within that, there are the four, right? The four major empowerments within that, then within each of that, you know, they might be subdivided, especially the vase empowerment uh, is, is can be further divided. The other three empowerments usually quite brief, actually. 
Later, we will see why, you know, like this, this vase empowerment is more detailed. And also later, we will see in these Vajra statements how Gyopa Rinpoche emphasizes that the vase empowerment is in fact, from one perspective, uh, the most important of the four empowerments. And then, of course, this is consistent with uh, Gyopa Rinpoche's emphasis that the foundational matters uh, is what truly matters, right? The so-called beginning level uh, is where the most profound things are already there. Then everything that comes later uh, uh, attempts to help us uh, fully and completely uh, understand, realize what was already taught at the foundational level. Uh, so this principle is applied to even the way he talks about the four empowerments. Uh, so later in this chapter, Again, the normal idea is that the fourth empowerment, oh, that's the most important, that's the most important, because that will bring you to Buddhahood, you know. But here, from, from arguing from another perspective, you know, Jigden Simgun says, actually, the first empowerment is most important. Most important for whom? You and me. Where we are, the first empowerment, the base empowerment, if we get that, then in, in a way you could say second, third, fourth is smooth sailing. If we don't get the first one, if we don't understand the first one, no matter how important the fourth one is, useless theory, even worse, might mislead you into thinking, oh, I understand the fourth empowerment and I am now good. I am now close to being Buddha. But if you don't have understanding and finally realization of the first, the Vesa empowerment, the other three have no meaning. So here, Jigden Samgan's statement in 5.2 is, you know, understanding the meaning is, is, is most crucial. Then what about, you know, uh, all the different steps, all the ceremony, uh, and then having things put on our head, having things put in the heart, and the throat, and the heart, and the hand, and left ear, right ear, <laughs> all those things. Hmm? They are only meaningful if you understand. And that's, you know, 825. Thus, Emphasize, do that, but then do that with understanding. Strive for understanding uh, deeper and deeper. And there, there are always deeper levels of understanding. So also you cannot just say, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? You know, like running around always just asking, what does this mean? What does this mean? Right? Uh, or when you are receiving empowerment, you know, actually it also doesn't mean, so, so let me clarify. It also doesn't mean that when you are there sitting there receiving empowerment that you're going, what does that mean? And then what does that mean? Well, what does that mean? Well, over there, what does that mean? No, no, no. <laughs> when you are already at an empowerment, you let your mind and body settle. And whatever you're able to absorb, you absorb. It's now. Well, when receiving teachings, then you can think, yeah? use monkey mind to think. So what does this mean? When he says this, oh, is it like this? Is it like that? Yes. Now, now we think, we contemplate, we try to work through. Mm -hmm. But when, when we're actually in an empowerment ritual, you have to tell the monkey mind, okay, now settle. Because uh, whatever you're able to grasp, meaning understand, you will understand if you relax and be present, and to that level, you will benefit. Don't, don't have, you know, this like, oh, but I did not understand, but I did not feel this, I did not think that, I did not wish. No, that's not the time. Either. So you cannot do it that way. Not, not helpful. <laughs> it's context, yeah. Uh, so in the in the commentaries, uh, in the longer commentary uh, for this, uh, 
uh, some interesting examples were given. So it tells us, you know, some nice stories, I think. So let me go look for it. Mm, it tells us some nice stories uh, about the, uh, the lineage masters. Mm -hmm. mm. So it says, um, for example, The, uh, so quoting uh, Jigden Sun Gun, you know, quote Jigden Sun Gun says, The understanding of mantra empowerment is such that it is taught to be the empowerment that purifies ordinary body, speech, and mind. And the mind grasping, uh, fixating on ordinary body, speech, and mind as three different separate things. So the understanding of secret mantra empowerment is such that it is the empowerment. What does the empowerment do? The empowerment purifies our fixated, uh, confused uh, understanding of ordinary body, speech and mind of the ordinariness of this body, speech, and mind, which is our current condition. So what empowerment does is that it clears uh, the mistaken notions of the ordinariness of body, speech, and mind. Going on, it says, the understanding of empowerment is only complete when the complete result of purification and transformation arises in the mental continuum. This may occur only after a long process. So these are notes, okay, uh, provided by uh, Professor Zobich, eh, the one who translated this. So he points out, he says, uh, both Rinchen Changchup and Zhuge Sherap, eh, these two earliest commentaries, they give the example of Geshe Potowa. Uh, Geshe Potowa is one of the famous uh, Kadampa masters. Uh, uh, Geshe Potowa was a student of uh, Dromtompa. Dromtompa was the main successor of Lord Atisha. Uh, Dromtom. Now, one thing to know is Geshe Potowa was a fully ordained monk, but his teacher, uh, Dromtompa uh, was a layman, uh, a layman. But uh, as far as we know, I think he he was a layman, uh, celibate layman. Just never became a monk, uh, never married or anything. Uh, it's like there's a type of upasaka laypersons that are called celibate upasakas. So anyway, his teacher. Uh, Dromtumba was a lay person. Then, of course, his teacher's teacher was a fully ordained monk. So this is about him. It says, uh, Rinjin Chanchu and Dojo Sherab state the example of Geshe Potowa, who had been fully ordained for 30 years. So after he was ordained, uh, 30 years later, when he suddenly he said, today, the disciplined conduct of renunciation arose in me. After 30 years of practicing, keeping his fully ordained monk's vows, he says, today, finally, uh, true renunciation arose in me. And then he says, my preceptor is the layman uh, at rating, talking about drum tumpa. Uh, so this is supposed to be a kind of a ironic and even shocking statement. My preceptor, uh, he, he's using monastic uh, um, title. Yeah? Preceptor is the person who gave you your monk's vows. If you're a monk and you say, my preceptor, my upadaya. Uh, and he says, my upadaya uh, is that layman from Reiting. Mm -hmm. Which of course, ordinarily not possible because the layman of Reiting uh, did not have the monk's vows. Uh, you cannot give what you don't have. 
But here, Geshe Botowa says, you know, today I finally have true renunciation arising after 30 years. So that means he says, you know, 30 years ago, when I requested the fully monk, ordained monk's vows and received those vows, so the, the actual, uh, I mean, not actual, right? Uh, because now he says the, the actual Upadaya is the lay person from Reding. So meaning the ceremonial Upadaya, right? The ceremonial preceptor who gave him those vows was somebody else, some other fully ordained monk, not, not uh, the layman from Reding. Uh, so what he means here is like through the kindness of his uh, teacher uh, who guided him, even though he was a lay person, uh, technically don't have uh, the monk's vows, but it is through his kindness. Uh, it is through him uh, that he was my preceptor, he says. Uh, so Professor Zobich here says, he indicates thereby that the meaning of ordination, which is, you know, here uh, used as uh, equivalent of the meaning of empowerment, may only arise long after a ritual act has been performed and independent of the usual conditions. As here, the preceptor is said to be Dom Tom, who as a layperson normally could not serve as a preceptor at an ordination. <laughs> likewise, Gampopa, uh, Professor Zobich continues, he says, likewise, Gampopa attained the full realization of empowerment only after, quote, practicing based on the teachings of Jason Miller for six years in the Neogi Seva Valley without leaving his seat. And so Gampopa also, six years after uh, being trained by Milarepa, at this point Milarepa has passed away. And one day, you know, Gampopa said, ah, finally, I understand the empowerment. Now, today, I have received empowerment from my guru, Milarepa. Yes. Therefore, true empowerment is obtained with the arising of the realization that evolves from the blessing of practicing the authentic guru's pith instructions based on one's devotion to the guru. So this then also means, you know, when we uh, attend empowerments, you know, don't have you know so much expectations, unrealistic expectations. You know? So even if you go and you say, "Well, I don't know fully what it it is. I didn't get what I was expecting," but understand that you are being inducted, you are being introduced for the first time, so to say, right, into a particular practice, a particular uh, deity principle, then you now have to do the work hmm, of really practicing. And then maybe 20 years later, if you're fortunate enough, uh, you will say, ah, today I finally uh, got, got, the empowerment. <laughs> so 5.3 uh, uh, is, is related to, to this in that it's talking about, um, let's look at 5.3. It says, 5.3 um, says, uh, Empowerment is obtained even with a single deity. Uh, so what is going on here is uh, um, over the development of Vajrayana in India, um, uh, various deities, various empowerments uh, became uh, um, and, and, and I mean sort of came into existence. You know, so different. Uh, figures, different gurus, different mahasiddhas uh, have different deities uh, giving different empowerments. Uh, 
So over time, mm, in the mature phase of the development of these traditions in India, uh, so among the Mahasiddhas who were wandering around in the wild, finally into like Nalanda, uh, Buddhist, great Buddhist university institution uh, that then provided an, a kind of a, um, a theoretical and organized way of understanding all these things. At that point, there is this uh, widely accepted view. I mean, to, to a large degree, is still... Uh, kind of the mainstream position today, that um, in order to re so then they begin to divide the things and they say, there is what is known as empowerment, wangkur uh, in Tibetan. And then there is also something known as jinlap, blessings. Of course, we use blessings in a very non-technical way. But there is a technical ritual called Jinlap blessings. Then there is another technical term called permission. Permission. Jenang. So Jenang Jinlap Wangkur. Jenang is permission. And that is a type of ritual that confers, that gives you permission to practice this or that deity. That's called Jinang. Then Jinlap is a blessing of a particular deity that um, you could say connects you with the deity. Of course, the Jinang, the permission, is also a way of connecting, but the Jinlap is another way of connecting. Then the full extent is Wangkur. Now, not all deities have Wangkur rituals. For example, according to some lineage, they say, whereas Chaka Samvara has Wangkur rituals, full deity empowerment ritual, and recently, His Holiness gave that in Vietnam. So, whereas the deity Chaka Samvara has a full Wangkur ritual, the consort of Chaka Samvara, Vajavarahi or Vajayogini, there is no, they say, Wangkur rituals for connecting with her. So you connect with her first by receiving the Chaka Samwara Wangkur, the full empowerment of Chaka Samwara, because she is included in that mandala of the full empowerment. So in that full empowerment, at the very least, there is male Chaka Samwara, female Vajavarahi in union, and then in the four cardinal directions, the four Dakinis. This is the reference here to single deity. But in the one core case, one cores are usually given on the basis of not just one deity, but a deity complete with the whole entourage, a whole retinue. At the very least, the deity and the consort. And then beyond that, now, now you have two, right? Now you have two deities, so to say. And beyond that, emanating out from the cent center, the four directions. And then maybe the four cardinal directions. Then maybe upwards, downwards, and so on and so forth. Up to like the Kala Chakra has 722 <laughs> deities. So in order to give a Wankur, it has to be this kind of a collection of deities, according to this mainstream view. So first you have to receive the Wankur. Then, of course, by now you have connected with Vajavarahi. But if you want to do specifically Vajavarahi practice, then you need to receive, according to this explanation, you need to receive the Jinlap, the blessings of Vajavarahi. 
which is a shorter, more compact empowerment ritual. And in this empowerment, maybe only uh, you have to visualize only Vajavarahi or maybe Vajavarahi with four of her Dakinis. Uh, but this is called a Jinla, a blessing of Vajavarahi. Jena is an even more simple uh, ritual uh, that connects you with uh, a particular deity. Uh, but according to this mainstream position also, they say you, should, you can only receive a Jena if you have first received a Wangkur, or at least at some point you have received a Wangkur. Because the Wangkur is the most complete um, way of being inducted, of being brought into Vajrayana practice. Then Jinlap and Jenang are further kind of further specific connections to specific deity principles that you can then add on to on the basis of the one core. So for those who follow this explanation, they, they are sticklers, they are very strict. They say, first you have to have one core. No one core, your jinlap will not work. Receiving jinlap will not work. Receiving jinlap will not work. <laughs> yeah. So this statement, statement three, is related to this issue. So here, Kyobarambaji says, empowerment is obtained even if the ritual involves only a single deity. So to those who specialize in secret mantra, they will say, no, 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 no. You are making it too easy. You're breaking the tradition. <laughs> so let's look at Campbell Kumpel's commentary. Furthermore, empowerment is obtained even with a single deity, such as Vajrayogini or a single uh, male deity without consort. Due to the different classifications of deities, empowerment can be obtained even if the three divine seats are not actually complete. Now, what are the three divine seats? Densum. The footnote tells us the three divine seats or gatherings are the Buddhas of the five families with their consorts, so Buddhas, male and female, the Bodhisattvas with their consorts, Bodhisattvas, male and female, and the wrathful deities, male and female. These are called the three seats, the Densum. So this is referring to a full secret mantra mandala. And so Chaka Samvara in the middle, in, in union with consort Vajavarahi, the four Dakinis in the four cardinal directions, uh, then other deities in the four intermediate tradition, uh, 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 directions, uh, then uh, 16 male and female, uh, 16 male, 16 female bodhisattvas, then wrathful guardians on the outside. These are the three seats, uh, the three collections of deities. So here, Empowerment can be obtained even if the three uh, divine seats are not actually complete. But they must be complete implicitly through the visualizations of the deity in front, oneself as the deity, and so forth. So basically here, Kim Kumpel is explaining Kyopa uh, position, which is that if you, even though the ritual may not have uh, a complete mandala, the three seats here, exp using the expression, the three seats, the three collections of deities. If when you are receiving the Jinla of Vajrayogini, you understand uh, that within her uh, are all the three seats. Uh, so implicitly, then empowerment is possible, right? It's always empowerment is possible, whether we receive it or not receive it, well, that depends on our circumstance. 
The reason is stated in the Guhya Samaja Tantra. In brief, the five aggregates are proclaimed by the Buddha to be the five Buddhas. The Vajra sense sources are the supreme mandala of the Bodhisattvas. The earth element is Lochana, the water element is Mamaki, Pandara and Tara are well known as fire and wind. Unquote. Even if these are complete, the master and the disciple need to be aware that the three seeds are included. If they are not aware of that, then the act of empowerment is not complete and thus the ritual will not be authentic, will not work. And so here the emphasis is on more inner understanding. So that even if it is just a Jinlap ritual and not a Wangkur ritual, if the master conferring the empowerment understands that all three seats are complete here, and disciples understand that all three seats are complete here, then, emp then empowerment in, in the deeper sense becomes possible. The statement here also has a historical context. Uh, that I should mention, uh, which is that uh, when Gampopa's community uh, began to grow uh, exponentially, so Gampopa began as a Kadampa monk, and I would argue he also passed away as a Kadampa monk. He never stopped being a Kadampa. But at some point in his life, Oh, by the way, footnote, this Medicine Buddha practice, the empowerment, uh, Gampopa is one of the lineage masters uh, because he was a great doctor. Uh, anyway, mm. so Gampopa began as a Kadampa monk, studied with some of the greatest Kadampa masters of his time. Then at some point, uh, he felt that uh, he has reached kind of like a uh, like a a roadblock uh, that he 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 could not like progress further uh, in his meditation in his practice. Uh, then, through his uh, past kar karmic connection to Milarepa, past lifetimes, he heard of Milarepa and became inspired to go visit Milarepa. <clears throat> and hoping that Milarepa could help him. But his Kadampa masters were very reluctant. They said to him, no, please don't go, because he needed their permission. This, this was in the good old days, you know, the <laughs> so-called good old days. I don't know, maybe you say, I don't like those good old days. Milarepa felt that he needed his teacher's permission to go seek instructions from other teachers. Today, if teachers insist that, we say, oh, he's trying to control us. Well, maybe he is. I don't know. You know? But the meaning of this should not be lost, right? that we should consult. I mean, if we're serious about this process, are we going to be our own doctors? There is a line between taking responsibility for our own healing and knowing the limits of what we know or don't know. Anyway, Gampopa said, please let me go. His Kadampa master said, no, you're not allowed to go. <laughs> and he pleaded with them, pleaded with them. He didn't give up. Finally, they said, we, we don't think you should go because we don't think he has anything. <laughs> so maybe a little jealous, or maybe just they don't know who he is, you know? You have to understand, right? This, this is you know, some guy in the mountains, you know, supposedly doing some amazing things. So there, there's that, Milarepa. Huh? Then there is like the Kadampa monks, with monasteries, well-established, everything. And here, a promising student is saying, I, I, I want to go into the mountains. There is this guy. 
So the Kadamba master said to him, we will let you go on one condition. And the condition is you will never abandon your robes. Meaning you will never give up your monk's vows. If you can promise us this, you have our blessings. You can go. So Gampopa agreed. Gampopa said, I, I, I will, I promise, I will not give up. And in fact, probably there were monks who went to Milarepa and then Milarepa, you know, then over time they joined Milarepa and they never then they gave up their monks' vows and wander around with Milarepa. So probably there was that reputation, you know, like, ah, oh, be careful if you are amongst your monk disciples, if they go to Milarepa, they will get, you know, they will be misled. So anyway, Kampopa went and, you know, and Milarepa was who he needed to help him break through that, that, that block. So anyway, then now Milarepa passed away. Gampopa continued to practice and for six, seven years he was in retreat. Now, now then we know, you know, when he went to southern Tibet <coughs> to, to set up like his retreat place, he didn't go alone. His fellow Kadampa monks went with him, some of them at least. So he, when he went there, essentially it was still a Kadampa community, like his fellow Dharma brothers started to come to where he was and they stayed with him and they were all in retreat, like you know, in their own cabins. So Gampopa practiced for another six, seven years. Finally, he had his complete breakthrough, his awakening. Then disciples started to turn up. Because Milarepa told him, you know, you, you don't teach, you don't do that business until you have reached uh, the level of being awake. So then disciples started to gather, uh, and more and more disciples uh, started to gather. Then when these disciples came, initially, based on what we know, Gampopa uh, they would come and want Gampopa to guide them, to give instructions to them. And Gampopa, apparently in this early period, would send his disciples to go receive the Wangkor Jinlap, you know, from other masters. Because at that time, uh, the differences between lineages is not so distinct yet, you know, like I've said before. Simultaneously, it was distinct, it was also not distinct. It was not distinct in the sense that uh, moving around to different teachers is not so uncommon. In fact, sometimes in this case, like Gampopa will say, okay, you want me to instruct you on the further details of generation stage practice or completion stage practice, first let me ask you, have you received a proper empowerment? And if they say yes, then Gampopa said, okay, then I will instruct you. If they said no, <clears throat> Gampopa will say, well, I tell you what, why don't you go to that other valley? <laughs> There's a great Lama there who gives one, uh, this Wangkur. You go receive the Wangkur, then come back and I will instruct you. <laughs> Yeah. So Milarepa, uh, um, Gampopa himself received one core from his Kadampa masters and also received one core from Milarepa. But himself, at the beginning, he would send his disciples to other people. So they would go and they come back. But later in his life, later in his uh, kind of teaching life, Instead of sending people to elsewhere and say, oh, you don't have a one core, 
you need to go here there he said i will teach you and but before i teach you since you don't have a one core i will give you the vajra yogini jinlap remember this the second type the blessing i will give you a vajra yogini blessing which is essentially now this is where i think other people disagree with kampopa kampopa says the jinlap ritual is basically a one core ritual although technically it's different essentially it's the same so i will give you jinlap ritual then i will instruct you that became a criticism a strong criticism from the <laughs> the, the ones who emphasize no it doesn't qualify so it's it's those positions that says a single deity ritual like the jinlap of vajavarahi is insufficient for giving it's insufficient as the requirement of transmitting empowerment so this is the kind of the broader background to this issue here understand <laughs> i think the implications for us is uh, i i i think you know, uh, i i mean i like all this history stuff but if you don't you're not the kind who like these things but still i think having an understanding of where all this you know, different opinions are coming from and what is really at stake and what is the take home i think the take home here uh, is that on the one hand if we can do it in the most kind of uh, detailed way very good but the detailed way uh, is still the finger pointing to the moon the moon is something else so if you meet with a teacher who has the ability to show you the moon without having so many devices it is possible for you to see the moon even without so many devices and after all seeing the moon is most important then once you caught a glimpse of the moon you need to habituate looking at that moon so through your practice you become more and more familiar, more and more familiar, more and more familiar, more and more familiar, until clear understanding arises with regards to the qualities of the moon, with regards to your inseparability from that moon. Then, you know, this is what really empowerment is and tomorrow uh, we will look at we will begin uh, by looking at uh, because Rinjen uh, Chanchuk uh, gives us uh, a statement here he says uh, this 5.3 should be read together with 5.26 and 5.27 526 and I mean 826 and 827. So 826 and 827, we're at page 36 if you have the physical book. It says uh, the third Vajra statement, 53, empowerment is obtained even with a single deity, should be combined with the two supplements, 826, which says, even though one deity, all activities are accomplished. Even through one deity, all activities are accomplished. And 827, the primary deity holds the characteristics of all the other deities within that mandala. So easy enough, I think we already covered. <laughs> and so it shows, you know, like, like after all, right? The retinue of the mandala is not like there are some other 
deities or some other principle, you know, coming from somewhere else. They all emanated from the central deity. Yeah, so if you understand the central deity has all these qualities, then that is sufficient. So sometimes then again, you have the deity and then there is the four Dakinis with the four Buddha activities. Yes, there's good reason and there's benefit in chanting the mantra of each of the four Dakinis because it can help, you know, kind of more easily bring out those qualities. And, and that's why, of course, of course, that's why there is the mandala with so many deities. And therefore, yes, it is good if you can get a wangkur. And then the jinlap, very good. But don't get so caught up in. Don't get so caught up in. And, and especially if getting caught up in huh, all the details with a lot of fear. Vajrayana is like yeah, a lot of fear factor. <laughs> I, 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 I would say, you know, if your primary connection to these teachings are with me, you have not encountered all the fear factors. I, I don't like using those. But if you hang out long enough in other you know, Tibetan communities, centers, teachers, yeah, you, you'll hear a lot of very scary things. Maybe I'm you know, blindly you know, making you not afraid and then, you know, there are in fact lots of dangerous things out there. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's not useful or all that. So it's not just I think I, I would argue, you know, there's a basic principle here. And I, I would say, you know, Kyobajik Denzimgen, especially the way he teaches, you know, the way Kampopa teaches, it's, it's not like that. <laughs>